Um, we're talking about conventional travel demand model systems. As you can see here, I'm just giving a second to get the pointer. Where is it? Yeah, as you can see here, uh, it's the typical demand supply interaction at a very high level. Um, and we're talking about Asian based, activity based models at a large spatial scale. Uh, they are multi model, so we're considering several modes, uh, typically medium to long term planning, but short term is also possible. And we model a typical day of transportation. Um, what we're proposing to do in general terms is to add a third dimension to our models, and uh, which is service provision. And this is important because new mobility services are really dynamic and they are not as simple anymore. And I'm going to develop on uh, service provision as the presentation unfolds. So the problem, and I'm gonna briefly talk about the challenges of, of modeling mobility services and mobility as a service. And the problem is that it's inherently a moving target. So these services grow really fast. There's a broad range of them. And even when things service, there's a lot of variants like car sharing, for example, it can be free floating, can be round trip. And they change a lot with emerging technologies such as autonomous vehicles and uh, electric vehicles and shared mobility and all these things. So it's really difficult because you can come up with models that can be outdated pretty soon. Um, then we have the dynamics of the services. So they are adaptive, responsive, they are real time. Uh, they also involve human drivers and that the fleets are uh, driven by humans that make decisions. So in short, supply cannot really be characterized in simple ways anymore. It's, it's much more complex than before. And when we talk about mobility as a service, there's an unprecedented level of integration. So we need to be much more explicit in our um, representation of these services if we want to integrate them to uh, an adequate extent. So based on these um, uh, challenges, uh, objectives and hypotheses can be formulated. And to address moving target and uh, uh, mobility as a service, we are trying to aim for generic and flexible solutions, trying to abstract out service provision and uh, come up with an overarching framework that allows us to uh, instantiate several services instead of siloed efforts in the sense of uh, sometimes we just focus on car sharing, the service changes, or, or sometimes we can, we can uh, use the generality that can exist when, among how mobility services provide service, and that's an hypothesis that we are making and that we actually uh, verify to a large extent. Uh, but also to address dynamic services, we have to capture spatial temporal dynamics to a much larger extent. We have to model operational activities of service providers like uh, matching or how they rebalance fleet. These things become more important now. And we have to model whenever present um, human drivers as decision makers. And the hypothesis is that we can adequately represent service provision and performance by capturing these things. And well, then a very specific objective is to implement a right hailing case study within the conceptual general framework. The motivation is that there's there's a lot of talk about these services and there's there's been a lot of talk, especially right hailing in, in the late years, but now more so uh, services such as e-scooters or so on and so forth. And um, there's a lot of pros and cons that have been tested so oftentimes with uh, involving um, sometimes uh, speculative, let's say adoption timelines or, or sometimes uh, perhaps at a cruder version that, that at least in my research we would like to capture. So, um, and then, well, we, we have, to, it, it, there's, there's an effort to model a service that can be contained within modeling the service. But when we're talking about large urban regions and multi-model transportation systems, we have to integrate these into the broader transportation system uh, and the model that we do. So that's why we want generic solutions and to streamline the implementation of, and modeling of mobility services. So how, how did we, try to get there and what was the plan. Uh, I started by, by a literature review comprehensively to try to, to assess service provision as an abstract concept from a lot of services. And that allows us to uh, build a conceptual framework. Um, then we moved into data and we uh, studied three data sets that I'm going to talk in a bit more detail uh, later on in the presentation. But the main modeling outcomes, and those are the bigger boxes here, is 
a prototype model that, that used uh, uh, big data from the city of Toronto, which is still limited, and I'm going to get into that in a bit too, uh, but an operational holistic model. And then based on right hosting, which is another big data set, um, we did data mining, some processes, and that allows us to model driver activity and the activities uh, performed by service providers. So just a little bit of fundamental principles. So first of all, we want to clearly distinguish between mode and mobility service. So a mode is a more physical hard entity if you want. It involves the vehicle type, the infrastructure where the vehicle operates, and a control system technology. Sometimes it can be AVs or perhaps guided rail uh, or automated rail. Uh, and then a mobility service is a softer entity or that involves the operational activities carried by providers, right, to, to enable service provision. And, and this is where service provision enters in the discussion. And then we want to separate services from networks. So conventionally, we have embedded public transit in networks. And, and this was a very elegant solution, very efficient, because it has fixed schedules and fixed alignments and stops and so on and so forth. So it was feasible. But now we have to uh, get away from that and, and uh, try to, to model service provision as its own because now mobility services are really much more dynamic and it's, it's how would you even go about embedding networks in networks uh, service such as ride hailing. It's, it's really not feasible. So then we move to activity base. So in the same way that we do for users, uh, we're trying to model the activities of service provider agents um, like matching, rebalancing the fleet, pricing, competition, so on and so forth. Uh, drivers, in, in the sense of their participation in the system, when they enter, when they leave, when they re-enter, how they accept or reject rides, uh, when they are uh, idling, whether they park, cruise, rebalance, and, and things like that. And a mobility as a service agent, which uh, focuses on multimodal solutions, on, on coordination, packaging things, uh, payment, and, and this kind of things for integrated mobility. And then we're talking about a bottom-up approach. So what we're trying to do is to generate a generic service provision process. When we establish that the main activities are matching, rebalancing, pricing, or dynamic pricing, and um, driver activity whenever uh, applicable, we realized that right hailing really checks all the boxes. So we started by right hailing, developed a service provision process for it, and then tried to generalize it and make it more generic, more abstract, so all the services can be instantiated. So what does it look like? Um, our models are time step based. So let's say we start uh, by batching, which means we retrieve at a given time interval the number of users and their trip requests and the number of available vehicles. If there is dynamic pricing, we can look at metrics such as supply demand ratios to establish surges or, or whatever uh, mechanism uh, is triggered. Based on this, drivers can react. They can choose to leave the system or not. Uh, and if they left, we have to update the number of available vehicles. Once we do that, then we can proceed to match match users to vehicles. And this is, a, a, as I'm going to get in a second, it's a matching can be seen as a more generic process. And I'm going to get into an example of that. If there are oversupply conditions, meaning more vehicles than users, then vehicles that are left idling can enter a rebalancing trip if, if it's asked by the provider. They can remain parked or they can cruise the, the, the system looking for better places. So how does this service uh, can uh, house other, or sorry, this process can house other services. So let's take uh, driver activities pretty particular to ride hailing. So, but users are still a generic input, right? And then let's consider uh, an e-scooter service, right? So, so we still have to get the number of trip requests, the number of available vehicles, and then matching is still generically pairing users and vehicles. If it's in advanced booking, then it's done through the app. If it's first come, first serve, users pick the vehicles. But at the end of the day, we have to keep track of users and vehicles and, and who is riding which vehicle. Um, in this case, cruising is not 
uh, relevant because there's no drivers, but vehicles can remain in the stations or sometimes there is rebalancing mechanisms in which uh, sometimes it's uh, user-led, so there's incentives for users to do so, or it can be simply by trucks as uh, it's done in bike sharing systems as well. So now how does this all fit within the broader scope of things? So what you see on the on the left is the conventional model system, uh, demand and previously supply. We have now re relabeled it as networks. Uh, but then everything on the right is what we're proposing to add. So let's start with the mobility services component. This component houses every mobility service and any mobility service that, that uh, is meant to be instantiated. Each one of them has its own instantiation of the generic service provision process. Now, each service talks or, or communicates with its fleet, and this is important to keep track of spatial temporal availability and to model pseudodynamics in a way. If there are human drivers, then the service fleets interact with uh, the driver activity component in where we model all decisions of drivers. Now, where does mass come into the picture? Uh, it's still an intermediary between users at the demand side and service providers. I would like to note that at the end of the day, the main unit of analysis in, in these models, uh, model systems, are trips. So in the conventional sense, a trip is passed to the network when uh, users use their own vehicle. If they are using mobility services, they request a trip to the service provider. After the service provider does its own process, at the end of the day, a trip is passed to the networks. And the same with mobility as a service, it's just an intermediary. So users request to mobility as a service, mobility as a service request to service providers because they package service providers at the end of the day. And ultimately, a trip is passed to the network. A brief uh, note on data, we analyzed three data sets. Uh, first, it was uh, the transportation tomorrow survey, as uh, many of us uh, I'm sure are aware this is a very large survey, is one of the largest in the world, but its granularity, it's insufficient for modeling this kind of dynamic services. We did some tests and, and its uh, trips are capped to the five minute uh, precision and it's really not sufficient. Then we collaborated with the city uh, to review the bylaw for vehicle for hire and this was a big, big data. Uh, but the problem is it's limited to demand. And what do I mean by this? Trip-based data are trip records, right? So we do not know anything about drivers, or there's no driver ID in the data set, and we do not know anything about pricing. So in a manner of speaking, we have one out of three key pieces of the puzzle. And then because of this, I analyzed also right Austin data, which is an enhanced data. It has more features. Uh, and I'm going to describe this now. Um, basically, um, Ride Austin data has driver IDs attached to every trip record and has en route variables, time and distance. So this allows us to do higher complexity implementations. And what do I mean by that? It's formally modeling driver activity and formally modeling service providers' activities. Toronto is, it doesn't really allow for this. It's still requires, right Austin, requires extensive data mining. So this diagram is actually uh, pretty informative to, to, to realize what do you get out of tree-based data. It's basically this box. So you get pickups, you get the travel time, you know, locations and all that and drop-offs, but you're missing a whole lot of things. Uh, the en route part, which is from the driver uh, starting the trip to go pick up. We do not know anything about that. In Ride Austin, we do. Uh, and it allows us to infer some things, like locations of vehicles prior to, um, but also we don't know anything in the idling period, right? Uh, it's basically the time in between consecutive trips. But there's also data that's not inferable, even with a data set like Ride Austin. We do not know the users that never got a trip because it's not in the trip records. And we do not know the drivers prior to their first trip we do not know what they did we do not know how long they waited for a first trip for example so there's still data limitations even with this data set so let's get into results and into more modeling stuff a bit so as you can see this is an instantiation of the generic service provision process for ride hailing but it has a twist here to overcome limited data so let's consider this example literally actually 
there's three users, uh, sorry, three vehicles and four users at a given interval, right? Let's say by modeling driver activity, and in this case, driver activity is a very crude representation, but actually very efficient. I'm going to get into that uh, later on. But let's say uh, by modeling driver activity, uh, one vehicle decided to leave. So you're left with two vehicles, four users, right? But we know these are observed trips, so there must have been at least four vehicles, so we generate two. This is what we call supply catch-up process. And by doing so, we let the model catch up with patterns over time. Then we proceed to match. And note that even with this supply catch-up process, sometimes there's more vehicles than users, so oversupply can also happen, right? When that happens, we also model cruising and keep going throughout the day. So let's talk a bit about, because uh, I mentioned here matching uh, and driver activity. So I'm just going to briefly uh, uh, elaborate a bit on that. So we tested in these models a greedy algorithm, a centralized greedy, and a Hungarian algorithm. Basically, greedy means we have a pool of users, pool of vehicles, right? We pick randomly a user and find the closest vehicle. The matched agents are removed, and we keep doing the process. In centralized greedy, we look at all users, all vehicles, find the shortest connection, remove agents, and keep going. But note that order still matters here, and it still has an impact. When we talk about a Hungarian algorithm, then we are looking at all combinations and all possible orderings at the end of the day. So this is a truly optimal outcome at the level of the time interval. Now, how do we model driver activity? So Basically, we got very scattered and very simple data that allows us to uh, assume this, if you want, crude assumption that the number of driving hours per shift, the median, the, the mean is three and it's centered around zero to six. So, so it's, 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 it's a pretty feasible. We started from a data that suggested that drivers uh, spend on average 30 hours on the system so if they drive two shifts and five days a week that's a mean of three right and then we start by that it was the only information we could get so it's it's really hard to model when you don't know how they operate so we started by this um, and then we generated a cumulative density function out of this uh, pdf and the main principle is as the number of hours per shift increase the drivers are more likely to leave so if the driver drove two and a half hours, the probability is 0.29. If the driver drove four hours, the probability is 0.85. And then we just generate a Bernoulli trial based on these probabilities of leaving or not the system. Uh, later on, I'm gonna get into, into formal modeling of driver activity and how this contrasted with formal models. So some of the metrics we are looking here at, these are outputs, right? Uh, number of trips over the day, this is a typical uh, curve seen in transportation by model um, and then the number of available vehicles is in green and this is prior to the catch-up process so you can see that in some parts there's there's an undersupply so the model in these cases just matches demand and then there can also be oversupply and this oversupply is generated by drivers not leaving the system yet let's say uh, then the number of drivers that were unmatched over time and how vehicles entered into service, which is telling us that there's around 13 to 12,000 vehicles entering at the end of the day. Um, so how did we validate this? Um, we got wait time uh, variables observed in, in the data set. So all the, the gray sh uh, shades here represent the, observed, the distribution of observed wait times. Each facet here is a combination of a matching algorithm and a distribution of uh, work hours. One is normal, the other one is a log normal distribution that we actually got from Wright Austin uh, to have a reference. Um, and uh, each uh, color or uh, uh, of the curves within each facet represents a time interval, 30 seconds, one minute, and five minutes. As you can see, five minutes is always the combination that, that replicates best observed patterns. And uh, we found that this is a pretty encouraging result given that we started off from a very limited data scenario. So we could replicate the shape and the tails to a pretty good extent. Uh, so this was very encouraging for us. And then 
we moved also to uh, validate the models we got from the city uh, apart from the data set uh, unique drivers per hour the number of unique drivers that were active within an hour but we got this from different days than the one we could model so we normalized this by the maximum having done so it, we were really happy to see that, that the model could really get very close to observed patterns of unique drivers per hour. And this is an inherently supply-oriented metric, if you want. So we were pretty happy with these results. Then we moved to formal modeling of driver activity. Uh, and, uh, and we used right Austin here. So the first part was data mining and was to generate driver activity logs. What do I mean by a log? It's basically, the history of uh, trips that a driver did on a given day and over all the course of, of all days. So what did we do? We took the trip-based data set, we transformed it into a list of lists. Basically, this means we took each driver and gathered all the trips that they served in a day for every day they worked. And then we have trip chains per day, right? And then we fill the gaps. So what's the main rationale to fill these gaps? Between two subsequent trips, for example, in this case, if the time in between them is more than one hour, then we classify it as an inactive period. If it's less than one hour, then it's an island period. And this one hour threshold is actually uh, common in the literature. We found uh, so, uh, some articles that, that uh, for different purposes, but assumed uh, a threshold similar to this. Having done that, we have a very um, detailed recollection of driver activity over a day. So with that, we proceeded to model their decisions. For example, to in this case, it's the decision to stay in the system, like a revealed decision, right? In this case, there's a decision to leave the system. And this is a decision to re-enter and so on and so forth. So we model that by hazard and logic models. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a second. Before that, how did we hypothesize a driver's decision-making? And, and it's actually quite sequential. So what you see here are states, inactive, three different sub-states of idling, en route, when the vehicle is going to pick a user, and in service. So decisions are what trigger changes between states. So in, when they are inactive, they can decide to become active, and so on and so forth. Um, so this allowed us to, to model it in a sequential manner, in a simple manner, but very efficiently. Now, how do we model the decisions that I mentioned to become active and become inactive and re-enter this? The re-enter would be after they were active, if they became inactive, to become active again, which is basically the concept of working several shifts in a day. So we used Cox proportional hazards model. In a nutshell, it estimates population and individual hazard, or it's the probability or, of death. And this is, why do I say death now? Because it's very, very uh, popular in the health sciences, but it's also applied in, in engineering. So the, the underlying principle is that there's a baseline hazard that represents the population, and it's just counting, I mean, not just, but in a nutshell, counting the number of deaths divided by the number of subjects at risk. But then what you do is you incorporate the effect of covariance in a multiplicative manner. Uh, the data that is needed is time to event, meaning the time until some event is observed. Now, we further extended the, uh, the Cox model to allow for time-dependent covariates, and this is also observed in the literature, uh, time-dependent covariates because it's inherently dynamic well, problem, and uh, to handle multiple events per subject, meaning shifts, right? So. For that, we used stratified models, so we stratified by the observation period, be it an inactive period or a shift. Both are accounted for different uh, decisions. And we standardized time scales to account for pure passage of time within an observation period. So in this case, this is inactive from zero to two hours. This is being on the first shift from zero to two and a half hours and so on and so forth. And we clustered also by work day, meaning that we uh, gathered um, the trips over the course of a day, because otherwise it's, it would be assuming that the drivers work for a continuous period of all the observation in the data set, which is, I don't know, four months. So it's important to cluster by day. So now having that, uh, we move to model performance evaluation. So 
these are binary models, right? Um, binary outcome models. The problem with the models is that they are uh, there's rare events here. So so the number of deaths, if you want, or or events, it, it's it's predominantly less than not having the event. So when you have that, establishing a threshold to 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 evaluate the model, which is normally used, for example, for confusion matrices and these kind of things, uh, it can be really biased. So we looked in the literature and we found a method called the receiver operator curve. So what does it consist of? Sensitivity is the power of the model to predict negatives correctly, and specificity is the power of the model to predict positives correctly. Each threshold that you establish after you have the model to, to characterize the outcome, it generates a specific value of these two metrics, specificity and sensitivity. So this curve is, the, is all the possible thresholds, right? So once you establish the curve, what you do is a threshold independent evaluation metric, which is the area under this curve. It ranges from 0 0.5 to 1. 0 0.5 means random assignment. So basically a Heather case experiment. The model has no power to predict. And 1 would be at the boundary and would be perfect discrimination. So for modeling purposes, though, uh, this, uh, oh, let's say, this model uh, performance evaluation uh, allows you to choose among models. But when you're trying to actually model uh, within uh, a travel demand model system, you actually need an outcome, right? You do need a threshold because you need to, to know is the driver leaving or not. You need the dichotomous one zero outcome. So for that, we developed our own uh, framework to assess which threshold would be best. We tested several methods, uh, analytical, but um, this one, this I'm gonna talk about the best one that we found, uh, and it's basically coming up with this area, the shaded in blue area, and the threshold that maximizes this area, it's basically the threshold that's going further apart from the lowest performance. So that's how we also defined optimal thresholds. And we conducted uh, standard tests of these models, which is uh, plotting the estimates of covariates, like the coefficients of covariates over time, and they have to show a parallel trend among strata and be roughly horizontal. So let's get into the results of these modeling efforts. Uh, before that, I would like to say, um, this metric is very similar to a conventional metric of binary outcome models, which is called correspondence. Correspondence, I think. Uh, sorry, don't quote me on that. But uh, anyway, there's there's a metric on, on these models that, and the literature suggests that um, a 0 0.6 value is is pretty good. So uh, we have a 0.7 value here, which which we deem as as very good. We are achieving sensitivity and specificity above 65 percent. And uh, remember, I promised to talk a bit about how this contrasts with our um, uh, cruder models. So the shade you see here, and this is a, a hazard curve, so it's basically telling you over time how does the hazard increase for drivers to leave the system. So this is the shade because there's, there's different strata. Each shift is a strata. And the blue and red curves are the ones that we used in our cruder models, and it's basically falling in the middle. So this was a very good um, corroboratory um, outcome for us. In terms of the decisions to re-enter the system, we found a 0.88, so this was pretty good um, outcome. So before I get into the first entry, um, we looked at the data itself to see, first of all, uh, the effective fleet. What does it mean? It means that if you have, let's say, 4,000 uh, 4, drivers registered, which I think it was about the number for ride hailing, not all of them enter service uh, on a given day, right? So the effective fleet is how many of your absolute fleet enter service. And we were uh, quite surprised to see that, that the patterns are pretty stable. It, this is January, this is February, and this is March. March was an incomplete, uh, it, data was incomplete, so we this 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 variability is because of that. But over every month, it was pretty stable. We did further investigation, and we realized that that why does it uh, grow from January to February? It's because the service was also scaling up a lot. But it was pretty stable. So it's important to note that for our modeling purposes, we do not care really if driver John Doe entered service or you know 
driver Kelly Smith. It, so we just basically took a 70%. So of all the drivers that we know that are registered, every model day, we just take 70% of them randomly and then proceed to model. So once they are instantiated, then it's important to keep track of driver number 1002 to see what this driver, X driver, does over the day. So having that in mind, we uh, and knowing that all the drivers are subject to enter at some point, these models now are interpreted as over inactive time. So as inactive time accumulates, this is in minutes, uh, what is the hazard for them to, to quote, quote, die, or meaning, dying meaning dying from being inactive, so enter service. We got a 0.7 here, which is also pretty good, and we basically reached the 65% threshold for both metrics. Um, in terms of service provider activities, we are also interested in modeling matching. So what did we do? This is a process that we carried in GIS, uh, and it's basically trying to step back into matching instance. So we have observed tricks. The first step is to decouple users from vehicles, because we have um, en route times, we can shift vehicles back in time, and because we have en route distance, we can generate a synthetic location. This approximation, it's a random point along the circumference, this uh, approach was is, is really a very good approximation because uh, patterns in right Austin are very dense, very uniform in terms of origins and destinations. And also it was, it was really a good approximation. Um, and then we could test the impacts of matching algorithm, time steps, the problem size, what do uh, service providers do when they have unmatched agents, be it vehicles or, or users. And we tested or, or measured this in terms of performance metrics, uh, like en route BKT and computation time. But we also wanted to establish trade-offs among time interval, computation time, and how optimal service can be provided. So yeah, I mean, I, I already explained the algorithms. I, I just included this slide to note that we also tested here a random, completely random uh, matching algorithm, which is basically just randomly picking a user and randomly picking a vehicle. That's absolutely inefficient, but it was um, so it, it was good for us to kind of like establish a very very low performance uh, boundary. So to not uh, go too long into this, uh, I just uh, got a couple of plots from, from our analysis, but this one is pretty good in the sense that we are comparing uh, the difference between observed and then route BKT, which is the axis here, right? That's the baseline. First of all, we can see how um, different algorithms compare uh, among each other Right, and, and you can see that in the zero to 60 second period, there's, there's, that's where the trade-offs kick in. But also this depicts a, a very, very nicely a challenge of modeling here because we do not know how service providers operate in reality. This is private information. And as you can see, a combination of time interval and the matching algorithm, there's all of them can generate uh, what we observed. So it's, it's really good to depict the challenge. In terms of uh, the, the trade-offs that I mentioned, each facet here is a matching algorithm, random, greedy, greedy, and Hungarian. What you see here is how computation time varies with time interval for all of them. And the green line is how optimal can you be compared to Hungarian algorithm, which is the, the highest performance boundary. So first of all, the first thought you can get is like, okay, you know, let's just do 300 seconds in any case, and then we're gonna get the highest optimality, right? But the, 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 the catch here is that as you go further along time interval, you deteriorate uh, service quality for users. So having that in mind, you can see that a minute, 60 second, it, it's a, for all cases, it's a very, very balanced uh, middle ground. And this is actually in line with what we see in practice, which is one minute is quite common. Now let's talk about rebalancing. So um, first of all, based on the driver activity logs, we wanted to see if we can characterize the idling periods, right? So we um, used for now uh, some metrics that are like rational, like idle time, uh, the speed, because if you're in downtown, you go uh, uh, slower and probably rebalancing trips are more spread out. 
uh, or transitions from hot spots to cold spots, whether the driver is moving from a hot spot or cold spot, it, it's, it's very good information. The problem is that we do not have ground truth about this. As I mentioned before, we do not know how they operate in reality, service providers. So as soon as it's, it's verifiable, then, but this is the approach. In any case, regardless of, of having it, we uh, developed a direct rebalancing mechanism for human-driven vehicle fleets. What do I mean by this? It's quite common for service providers to use pricing or incentives as indirect approaches to trigger cruising or relocation decisions of drivers, right? This is, this is pretty common. What I'm talking about here is formal and upfront rebalancing, meaning that a service provider offers compensation for drivers to do rebalancing trips. And if you think about it, this is not that crazy of an idea in the sense that if you talk about bike sharing, right? The operator spends a lot in, in rebalancing the fleet with trucks or, or so be it. So if it made operational sense, why it's actually possible, right? We do not know that it, they might even be doing it already. Uh, sometimes they are proactive, sometimes reactive, but in any case, the idea is that whenever there's oversupply conditions, so idling vehicles, uh, the, the service provider can look at future system imbalances and then proceed to match idle vehicles to expected imbalances at a future time. And you can do that basically as a bipartite match. In terms of dynamic pricing, I think a lot of people is, is familiar with it, but it's, it's just trying to adjust to system states and it's trying to uh, make up for the imbalances observed. So high prices attract drivers and repel users and low prices do the opposite. And then there's an oscillation between them. How does it work? It's multiplicative in the sense that whenever a threshold is surpassed, surge factors are applied. And these thresholds are set by the service provider and normally are related to supply demand ratios or fleet utilization. It's important to know that it could also be reactive to other contextual system variables like weather, for example. It's possible that service providers uh, adjust to weather conditions or to the day, day of the week or wait times in the previous five minute interval, whatever it is. It's also important to know that my complexity here is that uh, it's spatially differentiated. So a search factor is normally set for each traffic analysis zone. Uh, because we have fair data in the right hosting uh, data set, we, with some data mining, we can estimate pricing. We tested linear regression or the logic, but we decided at the end of the day, the best approach was a two-stage approach. Why do I say one inflated? Because um, typically the zero inflated approaches account for the predominance of zeros in the data. In this case, it's one because one means no surge. One means that the surge factor is just not modifying the fare, right? So because it's uh, the first stage is a binary logic, surge or no surge, it's, it's a binary outcome model. So we actually use the, the, the framework we developed to test and to assess this model. Uh, and we got pretty good results, 0.84. Uh, we, could, we could really get good results here. In the second stage, however, uh, we did an order logic, which is trying to characterize uh, different, and we've been search factors because there was like, like the distribution of them was like after one to 1.5, it was like really, really small numbers in the other factors. And these results were not so good. We actually found uh, in the literature, more complex approaches, I, I, if I'm, yeah, it was a lasso approach, uh, a very, very nicely developed, and they found the exact same problem. And it's basically related with the fact that there is a predominance of rare events. And that really it makes it difficult to, to predict. So for our purposes, this was good enough. Like the, 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 the existence of these search factors is, is really, really small in the data sets, in both data sets actually. So it was good enough. So to wrap up, um, there are some, limit, uh, I would say limitations future work. Uh, we can test higher order matching algorithms like pool services. Uh, looking a bit into the future, perhaps re reassigning matches. And this is, it's important to note that because of encapsulation and modularity, this is just plugging in a different matching algorithm, but it doesn't change at all the service process. Uh, we, uh, we were also looking a bit into uh, transferring Austin and Toronto stuff to, to actually make up for the, for the lacks uh, of each data set. It was not that uh, feasible so far. 
um, we can model competition, we can do mobility service implementations and other services like bike sharing or e-scooters. Uh, I am, I think there's a student with Eric now that's looking into bike sharing, that's kind of like looking into the, into the framework and applications about DKTs, emissions, congestion. Once you actually model policy and regulation, once you actually model this at a, at a sufficient uh, detail, you can do a lot of things. Um, some publications out there, uh, and there's a couple more uh, uh, brewing. <laughs> um, and yep, that's that's it for me now. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And we will be taking questions. If you have any question, you can raise your hand. I will enable you to speak, or you can write in the chat box. Yeah. Let me exit this. No. Um, okay. Ah, I stopped sharing, I think. Yeah. So. So just a quick announcement before everybody leaves. Next week, there, because of CRB, there will be no um, webinar. Uh, we will continue the week after.